Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of AFTD's Healthcare Professional Educational Webinar Series, Differentiating Behavioral Variant FTD from Alzheimer's and Other Disorders. My name is Esther Kane, AFTD's Director of Support and Education. Thank you for joining us. We are going to begin the webinar shortly, but first, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items and AFTD information. Our audience will be muted for the duration of this webinar. This helps to keep the background noise to a minimum. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box and we will try to address them. Additionally, this webinar will be recorded and archived for later viewing on AFTD's YouTube page. Our next education conference will be head, held May 5th in downtown St. Louis, Missouri. This annual event convenes persons affected by FTD, experts in the field, and other healthcare professionals for a full day of learning and connection. For those that can't make it to St. Louis, it will be available online with our free live stream. This year's keynote speaker will be Dr. Bruce Miller from UCSF. Visit AFTD's website today to reg register for the in-person event in St. Louis or the live stream. One of AFTD's newsletters is geared toward healthcare professionals. Each issue of our partners in FTD care takes a deep dive into a particular disorder or specific aspects of care. Recent issues have focused on transitioning to residential care, FTD genetics, and what families should know and do after getting a diagnosis. There are over 30 issues of partners in FTD care available by accessing the web address at the bottom of your screen. Some more information about today's program. We are offering continuing education credits via Rush University for those watching this webinar live. This is part of AFTD's developing efforts to educate healthcare professionals on FTD and FTD care. At the conclusion of the program, you will receive an email with the CME submission information. Please note, you have 10 days from the date of the activity to complete the evaluation and claim credit. At the conclusion of this webinar, you should be able to describe three symptoms common to BBFTD or behavioral variant FTD that can differentiate it from Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. List two behavioral variant FTD symptoms that can be red flags, indicating that personality and or behavior changes are likely not caused by depression, bipolar disorder, or another psychiatric condition. And lastly, you'll be able to recognize the diagnostic criteria for possible and probable behavioral variant FTD. Additionally, there are materials related to this program located in the handouts box on your screen along with information about Rush University CME approval for this program. Before I introduce Dr. Rosen, we'd like to get a sense of the audience for today's presenter and program. We are gonna offer a poll question now. Have you ever seen a patient with behavioral symptoms who was diagnosed, diagnosed or later diagnosed with behavioral variant FTD or referred for a diagnosis? All right, so about 30% of you said yes a few times, and 32% of you said yes many times, where 19% of you said no, you've never seen a patient with behavioral variant FTD. Our next polling question, which of the following BVFTD or behavioral variant symptoms do you think would be the most troubling to assess for a possible or probable diagnosis? You can answer now. So 50% of the audience said apathy, um, they think would be the most difficult to diagnose, where 18% said behavioral disinhibition 
and another 18 percent um, said diminished response to other people's um, emotions and feelings. Thank you everybody for completing the polling question. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's presenter. Howard Rosen, MD, is the Dorothy Kirsten French Foundation Endowed Professor for Parkinsonism and Other Neurodegenerative Disorders at the Wheel Institute for Neuroscience in UCSF's Department of Neurology. His research focuses on early and accurate diagnosis of dementia. He has used a variety of experimental approaches, in particular brain imaging. He is a lead investigator on several projects aimed at improving diagnosis, particularly for frontotemporal dementia. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Esther. Um, and uh, I wanna thank uh, the Association for FTD for um, uh, asking me to do this talk and for, uh, I'm very proud really to be part of their um, uh, expanding efforts to uh, open up a dialogue with more community practitioners and and including primary care in that in that effort is really important I think to me and as well as to them uh, because it's really critical if we're going to be able to recognize uh, uh, FTD earlier um, and so I'm really looking forward to doing today's session so these are my disclosures, uh, uh, and nothing I think that's directly relevant to any of the topics I'll, I'll be talking about today. Um, so just to give a, a brief overview of, uh, of the structure of the talk, I'm going to start with a little bit of an overview of, of, the, of the basic biology of neurogeneration you know, at a very high level, uh, because I think it establishes a foundation for the approach that we take uh, and that we will continue to take to uh, diagnose these disorders like BVFTD. Then we'll talk about the, the signs and symptoms of BVFTD, the syndrome we'll talk about, because those signs and syndromes are the core to how we make a diagnosis. But we'll also, and uh, we'll also talk near the end about um, other tools that are emerging that, that, uh, and exist that can be helpful in uh, making the diagnosis of BVFTD. So first, just to briefly talk about neurodegeneration, you know, FTD is one of a, a, a number of neurodegenerative diseases that all have some basic things in common. They're mostly diseases uh, that occur in uh, adults and older adults usually, where the nerve cells undergo uh, a process of uh, uh, met dysfunction, shrinking, and eventually uh, death of neurons and other cells in the central nervous system. And we believe that the, those processes happen because of malfunction and abnormal modification of proteins that normally have different jobs in the brain. And that each of the neurodegenerative disorders that we talk about, we believe is, is associated with different kinds of protein malfunction. Um, we see the evidence of that protein malfunction commonly at autopsy, when we've been able to look at somebody's brain after they pass away as microscopic inclusions that can be seen inside and next to the nerve cells. So a classic example of a common neurodegenerative disease that we're all familiar with, I think, is Alzheimer's disease, where we have the accumulation of this and the modification of this protein called a beta, which eventually accumulates in small inclusions uh, inside the, the, the nervous system called amyloid plaques. And there's another protein called tau, which uh, gets phosphorylated and modified in other ways and accumulates in these little uh, inclusions inside the nerve cells called tangles. And those features, plaques and tangles microscopically, um, denote, they, they really are uh, um, the, the indicator that someone had Alzheimer's disease. Frontotemporal dementia, on the other hand, is associated with different kinds of protein accumulation. Uh, one of the common proteins in about 50% of patients with FTD is a, some, a protein called TDP43, which can then be seen in inclusions inside and next to the nerve cells at autopsy. And FTD can also be associated with uh, um, in, uh, accumulation of the tau protein. It's the same tau protein in, as you see in Alzheimer's disease, but it's modified and structurally different when it's in these inclusions and affects the nerve cells differently, we think. So this is the underlying process that we believe is happening in diseases like FTD. And, but so when we think about how these, disease, these changes that I'm describing cause symptoms, 
we really have to start to think a little bit about neuroanatomy. So the brain, of course, is divided into many different regions and structures, and these structures have different functions. And it turns out if we use Alzheimer's disease as an example, just going to get the laser pointer available. I'll try to highlight things as I talk. If we look at Alzheimer's disease and we look for these tangles, these microscopic tangles with tau in them that I talked about, you don't initially see them all over the brain, but one of the earliest places in the brain they accumulate is in this region called the medial temporal lobe where the hippocampus is and other related structures. That's a very important uh, part of the brain for memory function. And so that's why we believe that Alzheimer's disease, the earliest features, the earliest symptoms in Alzheimer's disease are memory loss, forgetting recent events, conversations, misplacing things, et cetera, and they can be quite disabling. But as the disease spreads to other parts of the brain, they start to accumulate, it starts to affect other functions, and that's where we hear other functions that uh, start to uh, also uh, go wrong in Alzheimer's disease. So, uh, so the 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 thing to understand about neurodegeneration is different proteins seem to affect different different parts of the brain early and spread in different ways. So, for example, in the behavioral variant of frontotemporal dementia, which we're talking about today, uh, you can see accumulation in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain. Just to remind people, we're looking at a, a picture of the brain viewed from the right side. So on the left side here is the front and here is the back and the lobes are labeled, the major lobes of the brain, frontal, parietal in blue, occipital in this gold brown kind of color and temporal in green. So you can see that the behavior, this is a map of all the regions typically involved in BVFTD, in the behavioral variant of FTD in red. And you can see that mostly we see changes in the frontal and temporal lobes. Another um, variant of FTD that we won't talk about much in this talk is uh, something called the semantic variant of primary progressive aphasia. And you can see the map showing that for the most part that disorder involves the temporal lobes a lot. And a third variant, which we definitely won't talk about today very much, is something called cortical basal degeneration, which happens to involve regions around the motor cortex and Indeed, it does involve a lot of motor regions in the brain. And so the idea is that um, as, as, a, um, as one protein disorder starts to affect a part of the brain, it starts to affect functions specifically that are mediated by that part of the brain. And as it spreads, it starts to affect other functions um, uh, that relate to the regions where it spreads to. So why is this important? Because the, the most reliable way that we have to track a disease and to understand how it's evolved over time is by our history. So by organizing our medical history, when somebody comes in to describe their illness, uh, if we say, first think about what symptoms are present and not present, that gives us a sense of which systems are involved and which are not. And then we ask what symptoms came first, it could give us an idea of which systems were involved first, where the disease started. And similarly, as symptoms have evolved over time, we can get a sense of how the disease has spread. And we'll talk about that, that pattern in frontotemporal, in BVFTD, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, we also can use other uh, tools like brain imaging to provide further evidence of the anatomy of where the disease uh, is involving. And that's really how we build a case for what the specific diagnosis is. So the last couple of slides about these proteins is to just have people understand, to help people understand where this behavioral variant fits within the sort of um, family of diseases we're talking about. So I mentioned uh, two proteins, tau and TDP43. There's a third family of protein called the FET proteins. And these three proteins make up all the kinds of different protein disorders that can cause FTD. Together, they, uh, our literature usually refers to those protein changes in the brain that relate to the FTD as frontotemporal lobar degeneration. And all these three, pro three proteins have in common the fact that they can injure and bother, so to speak, and cause changes in the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain and cause symptoms. As it turned out, those three proteins can cause a variety of different syndromes. BVFTD on the left is the one we'll talk about today, but 
accumulation of these proteins can also cause this semantic variant of progressive aphasia, a non-fluent other variant of primary progressive aphasia, two other syndromes that are can present with cognitive as well as motor symptoms that are similar to Parkinson's. Now we know that amyotrophic lateral sclerosis or Lou Gehrig's disease is also caused by this TDP43 protein and therefore is kind of it's closely related to FTD. And, uh, um, and lastly, th this new syndrome that we're learning about called chronic traumatic encephalopathy, it, which can occur in people who have um, you know, a, a frequent repeated head traumas like from occupations like football and other kinds of things. Um, that also is associated with accumulation of tau proteins. So FTLD, the proteinopathy, can really be associated with um, uh, a variety of clinical syndromes, one of which we're going to talk about today. And just to kind of complete the, 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 um, the discussion about terminology, often when people talk about frontotemporal dementia, sometimes they're talking about the behavioral variant that we're talking about. But sometimes these other syndromes, this semantic variant and non-fluent variant will be included in the term FTD. So you can keep this slide at, when it's available to you as kind of a reference for helping to understand the terminology and how all these things are related to each other. So last thing I'm gonna talk about before we jump into the symptoms is to understand how, you know, when this might be seen. So, of all of these syndromes that we talked about that could be caused by FTLD, the most common is behavioral variant or frontotemporal dementia. It's the one we know the most about for the longest. Um, we know that it, it tends to occur earlier than diseases like Alzheimer's disease. So most patients would develop their symptoms between their mid 40s and their mid 60s, but you can get patients who develop the symptoms even earlier than that or later than that. Of course, dementia and uh, neurodegenerative diseases are not that common below the age of 65 in general. But when, they, when it does occur in somebody who's younger than age 65, FTD is quite a prominent uh, possibility of what the cause is. It, it's estimated to be roughly equal in, in, uh, com in prevalence to Alzheimer's disease as a cause of uh, neurodegeneration in that age group. And once you go below 60 years, it's probably the most common uh, syndrome that causes a neurodegeneration. But as is indicated on the slide, you know, you can even see it in people who are older in the 80s and 90s when you would often see Alzheimer's. And we should recognize that when we're thinking about this family diseases, a lot of what we, what the statistics I gave relate to the, the those core syndromes that I talked about under FTD, those two aphasias, and this behavioral syndrome. But when you start to include all those other diseases that are part of the family, this set of disorders should be even thought of as more common. So, so it is something important to learn about and important to recognize, particularly in people who are uh, developing symptoms you know, in the earlier age groups that we're discussing. So now we're gonna talk about the symptoms and just give one example. This is a, an example of a case um, that we uh, saw in the hospital. Who he, he was admitted as part of a, a research assessment, but he's still in the hospital. So imagine you know, what he's talking about and how, um, and how uh, uh, likely you would expect a typical patient admitted to the hospital, giving a history to the fellow who's working with the patient to kind of bring up these kinds of things. Oh, I see. I'm having a little trouble getting my video started. My favorite song we write is, you know, Willie Nelson, the country singer. Uh -huh. he, he, did you ever hear the song, his Shotgun Willie? Did you sing a few bars? Uh, shotgun Willie sits around in his underwear, biting on a bullet and pulling out all of his hair. Shotgun Willie's got all of his family there. There's another verse, John T. Ford was working for the Ku Klux Klan. At six foot five, John T. was a hell of a man. John T. made a bundle selling sheets on the family plan. So I rewrote this for the Bush administration. Are you a Bush fan? Oh, please. Okay. Uh, shotgun W sits around in his underwear, biting on a bullet and wrecking the whole darn world. Shotgun W's got his whole cabinet there. Dick Cheney was working for Halliburton Oil. Hell, even as vice president, he's working for Halliburton Oil. Dick Cheney's going to make a bundle on the reconstruction of Iraq. <laughs> so I agree. Those are your letters. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You put some thought into that. 
I did, yeah. And I have a rude one about W. Fart gun W sits around in his underwear, eating beans by the pound and farting all over his chair. Fart gun W stripping his whole cabinet away. God, yeah. Got it, yeah. Which means we got a lot of fart this year. Yeah, yeah this is the year of the fart humor. Yeah. And the farts, yes. Yeah. Lots of farts. Lots Another of thing, am I allowed to fart? You're allowed to fart something? Oh. Oh, I'm a loud part. Yeah, yeah, I'm a loud part. Remember Eric from uh, Mary Poppins? Yeah, he loves to laugh. Right. So, uh, yeah. I love to fart uh, loud and long and clear. I love to fart. Uh, it's getting worse every year. The more I fart, uh, uh, the more I'm filled with gas. The more the gas, the more farts come out of my ass. <laughs> we're thinking made it. So it goes on a little more, but I, I think this video is very valuable for me to sort of illustrate that, you know, uh, the way a patient can present with this syndrome is not the way we typically think of a dementia syndrome. He's obviously uh, eloquent in speech. There's really no hesitancy in the way he talks. Um, I, I, some might judge he's funny. And clearly he's aware of current events. This was in the early 2000s. Um, and so his memory is not the problem. Uh, but you can see on the right that there's a lot of brain atrophy. This is the uh, right temporal lobe and left temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. And more importantly, what the reason he's presenting to us is because um, his uh, a tendency to uh, attend to and think about all these songs and games and and uh, 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 and and other you know sort of hobbies he's developed, uh, they they are interfering with normal activity. He's doing these instead of work, instead of other productive things, and in environments where it can be embarrassing, disturbing, problematic for uh, him and his family members, and that's what makes it a significantly disabling problem. And as we can see in the MRI, it does represent degeneration of the brain that's causing him to, to develop these habits. So, um, so you know, this is, I think, one example of the behavioral disinhibition we, we see. Um, other things, and I'll often give these kinds of things as examples to prompt family to see if, they're, if these ring a bell. So, you know, calling, uh, saying maybe insulting things in, in, in a public environment, like calling somebody fat at the mall when you should know not to say things like that to strangers uh, or um, eating off other people's plates at restaurants if something looks good, telling strangers um, um, uh, private or personal things about your family. You know, I've had patients do things like that in the grocery store to whoever's standing behind them. So, and if you ask questions like that, giving these kinds of examples, it can prompt the family to start saying, oh yeah, you know, I did notice that. And then they'll tell, you know, their story, their version of that. Another uh, common uh, syndrome that uh, we see is apathy. Um, so so uh, this is defined as a loss of interest in you know, activities that the person used to previously enjoy. Hobbies, of course, it can affect work. Uh, so they might you know, uh, spend um, little attention to their work or little interest in it. Um, they can have, it can be uh, associated with decreased interest in social activities. It can be replaced by a lot of very monotonous uh, activities like just watching television all day or or doing other, you know, uh, activities that, you know, aren't very active or meaningful. And the key is what is, although apathy and a loss of interest in things one used to enjoy is a core feature of depression. In this case, the the the, the reason we can uh, say that it's not associated with depression is because the person doesn't express the other symptoms of depression: feeling a low mood, hopelessness, worthlessness. Um, uh, sleeplessness, other kinds of things that we associate with depression. So once the apathy, that symptom comes up, they're not, they don't seem to be doing the things they used to enjoy. These are the ways to to, re, to get a sense of uh, whether it might be due to depression, which is, uh, you know, a, a frequent uh, misdiagnosis versus, uh, um, you know, something more uh, that could be related to FTD. Um, Another uh, a syndrome that we see is that loss of sympathy and empathy that uh, Esther asked about in, in the in the uh, 
uh, polls. So this can can be a little bit tricky. I think it's in you know the way we ask about this is just whether they seem to have a reduced interest or or um, uh, uh, um, um, seem detached when thinking about other people's problems. I think often uh, it, it, some kind of event needs to have come up which would have prompted a little bit of extra attention because of empathy. So um, I'll often ask about if you know somebody had an emergency and the person didn't respond in, in a way that would have been a, typical of them in the past. Uh, so you know, stories that I've heard in, in patients is uh, you know, their spouse or someone calls from the emergency room and says, I'm here and I had an accident. And then the, you know, the person who's affected with the disorder says, well, you know, are you going to be okay? And they said, well, yeah, but you know, uh, uh, it's going to be a while. I'm going to be here. They have to do some assessment. And the person says, well, tell me when you're coming home to make dinner and uh, I'll be waiting for you, that kind of thing. Um, and similar stories like that. And so again, to prompt a, a family member to see if that's going on, I might tell a short story like that and say, sometimes I hear things like that. Is that something that strikes you? Did something like that kind of happen? And, and did they react differently than they would have in the past? So that's, uh, the, and the last thing uh, that we'll, well, one of the other symptoms we'll talk about is these perseverative or stereotyped behavior. So uh, patients with FTD can start to focus a lot on, um, on uh, uh, get preoccupied with a, a very narrow range of activities and they can indulge in them quite a lot. Uh, they can be preoccupied with certain ideas, with certain foods or restaurants, wanting to go to them every day or uh, for instance, uh, they can be very rigidly adhering, adhering to certain routines, wanting things to happen at the same time in exactly the same way every day, and they can collect a lot of things. Um, I had one patient who um, watched the same movie uh, day after day, over and over, same two movies for years, um, as an example. It can be quite dramatic. Um, um, so, and here's an example of someone who's sort of uh, in this case, his wife is telling us about some of his uh, kind of tendencies that he's developed in this area. This is where Bob keeps all his possessions, his coins and his wallet, and he always has a pen in his book. And then he keeps his figures for his aunts and he records all of them and keeps them down by the day of the week and how many he killed. And then they stay here for quite a while. And then he also has all of his napkins that he likes to save, even if they're used or not. And he always has some in his pocket that he keeps. And a little stash of candy. Mm -hmm. Nine, 10. So this gives you a little bit of an idea of the nature of the sort of collecting and 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 kind of obsessive and compulsive kinds of behaviors you can see. So so I think it's important, and we'll come back to this again to think about you know why do patients with BBFTD, the behavioral variant, behave in this way? So as I've implied through the early part of the talk, it's really about the anatomy. Here's a similar map to the one we saw before of the brain. And all the red parts indicate, you know, where FTD, this behavioral variant of FTD, really hits the brain hardest. And you can see it, as I talked about earlier, it's in the frontal and temporal lobes. One of the things I think is worth pointing out, I'll get the laser pointer again, is if you look here, um, Alzheimer's disease can affect the frontal lobes as well to some degree. And so there's overlap between these two disorders. But the part of the brain that's really heavily affected in FTD that you don't see affected in Alzheimer's is this orbital part of the brain that's above the eyeballs and, and this medial part of the brain in the midline between the two hemispheres in the front. And these are regions that we know are very closely associated with social and emotional functions, which explains why patients with FTD develop these problems and we don't see them in Alzheimer's disease. So essentially, uh, the kinds of symptoms that, that we've been talking about, they represent uh, what, what you need to identify to make a diagnosis of FTD. 
And uh, there are several uh, published criteria that have been developed over the years. The most recent were published in 2011, which really focus on you know, the six of the most common and, and reliable symptoms that one could see in FTD. And the criteria basically say that if you have three out of six of these um, um, sets of symptoms, you can, um, uh, you can make a diagnosis of possible FTD. We'll talk about why possible in a minute or two. But, but uh, that's the sort of initial part that would be based mostly on the history. We're going to talk for a minute now about this executive dysfunction one, which we haven't spoken about yet. But uh, it's well known for many years that, um, that uh, the frontal lobes play an important part in a, a set of functions called executive functions. So these are um, things uh, like working memory, being able to keep some things in mind for a few minutes, or being able to generate from nothing sort of ideas um, and, uh, and, and start to make a plan and, and um, uh, being able to uh, inhibit one's basic response and think harder about a more appropriate response in a certain situation, planning and, and ordering and sequencing, all of those things are very important for the frontal lobes. And these are examples of tasks that neuropsychologists can do to probe the functions uh, that I'm talking about, these executive functions. But one of the things uh, that that we we I should highlight is the fact that those are not functions of the whole frontal lobe per se, but mostly they pertain to this lateral outside lateral aspect of the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is a big place; it has multiple regions, and the this region, this highlighted in green here, is the one that part of the brain that mostly uh, um, uh, mediates those kinds of of functions that I was talking about. The, as I said, the orbit, the medial and orbital parts of the frontal lobe, those are the parts that have to do with social and emotional function. So the reason that's relevant is, remember I said how Alzheimer's disease can also affect those dorsolateral uh, parts of the frontal lobe. And that's one of the sources of sometimes uh, when we um, misdiagnose FTD. So we've had many cases referred to us where the, the, the physicians or, or the providers and a neuropsychologist even recognized that there was a deficits in planning or executive function, characterized it with neuropsychological testing and said, well, here's, you know, here's a frontal lobe disorder with executive dysfunction, so therefore it's FTD. But in fact, in, if that's the story and it seems degenerative and it's evolving over time, it's more likely that that might have been caused by Alzheimer's disease. And what's really key about separating Alzheimer's disease from FTD is those behavioral features we talked about. Executive dysfunction is not enough. So that's one um, potential source of, of, um, of uh, misdiagnosis that's worth keeping in mind. Another area is, is confusion with psychiatric, uh, um, non-neurological psychiatric illnesses, which as we'll talk about is understandable. So uh, you can hear through the way we talk, the, you know, the symptoms I've talked about before, that many of the features we're talking about they overlap with symptoms that you know could be seen in neuros in psychiatric disorders, including depression, o OCD, things like that. And actually, several years ago, our group did a study looking at what kinds of psychiatric diagnoses were made before a person was diagnosed with frontotemporal dementia. And actually, it's notable that in every kind of dementia, there's a proportion up to 20, 25 percent of people that get diagnosed with depression before they get diagnosed with a degenerative disease. So it's important to know that I think often we label people with that depression uh, label uh, as we're trying to figure out what's really wrong with them. But that's twice as common in this behavioral variant of FTD as with any of these other syndromes. And the most common uh, 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 label that, that's applied to patients with FTD before they get diagnosed with FTD is depression, but it can also include bipolar disorder, sometimes schizophrenia, and on occasion OCD. So, so you know, we it makes sense from the way we've described the symptoms. It also makes sense from the anatomy. You know, this is a, another older paper we did that focusing on the regions very involved in FTD, and they include regions like the insula, which is another area very important for social and emotional functioning. And these areas in the medial frontal lobes, which I've been talking about before, this image on the right focuses on the amygdala, another very important uh, part of the brain for emotions. And what this slide is showing is, is that if you look at 
studies of people with uh, psychiatric illnesses, you can see many of the re same regions involved. This happens to be one looking at uh, regions of brain atrophy and bipolar disorder from a few years ago. And although the severity is much less severe, and there's no cell death or neuron, neuron death in bipolar disorder, the regions that are involved to the degree that they are overlap quite a bit with FTD. So it makes sense that the symptoms can be confused. And in fact, we've learned that, that even cases that we think have FTD sometimes um, appear not to. Now, um, it, um, and so, uh, you know, in the early, mid, later 2000s, you know, groups like uh, ours at UCSF and others, uh, particularly in, in the UK, started to publish the fact that they noticed that there were cases that they had diagnosed with FTD, um, implying that it's a neurodegenerative disease and that unfortunately it's something that will get worse over time. But they noticed that those patients didn't get worse over time. They stayed the same. They made some comments that it was most commonly men, but um, they, 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 when they looked at the, the data that they had when they first met those patients, they noted that they had good executive function on testing and that their MRIs were normal. And still, we don't totally understand what the etiology is for that kind of syndrome. They actually called it FTD phenocopy, meaning it looks like FTD, but maybe it isn't. And I think that uh, uh, syndrome is sort of still floating around in our literature, and it does represent a, a syndrome um, that we have to be uh, aware of. Um, and I don't think we know. In some cases, they may be psychiatric illnesses that could be otherwise labeled. But I think sometimes we just don't always know what the what the cause is. But I think that that literature really led to uh, 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 an element of the criteria that we'll talk about now, which is the fact that if you have these symptoms of FTD, and, or three out of six of them, as I said, we say, well, it makes sense to make this diagnosis of possible FTD. But you really need some additional evidence that it's a neurodegenerative disorder. And so usually you can get that from uh, functional decline. In other words, that the, the patient has uh, developed more and more problems over time, which have prevented them, them from accomplishing meaningful activities like work or other important um, uh, functions that they perform, uh, let's say, within their family. And also, um, uh, we want to see some evidence of, of neurological disease, usually through atrophy or hypometabolism on, the, uh, on imaging. We'll talk about that next. So, and, and therefore, if you have possible FTD and you have these additional features, then we kind of make the decision, well, it makes sense to call that probable FTD at that point. So this is just another example of an MRI that you might see with FTD where you know the, the spaces around the frontal, the, here's the temporal lobes, and around the frontal lobes are expanded because there's frontal atrophy. Um, and that's what you see, frontal and temporal atrophy. It can be seen on visual inspection of an MRI. There are formal rating schemes that one could use if you want, which we know uh, are reasonably reliable in trained people. But one of the things we, we also like to point out is, you know, um, these changes can be a little bit subtle and it depends on the judgment of the reader. And we know that sometimes radiologists won't necessarily call out the fact that the pattern of atrophy looks to be one that uh, might be consistent with frontotemporal degeneration. So, so, and they've pointed out, and, and we also noticed this in papers, is when that entity was mentioned as one of the reasons the MRI or the image was ordered, you know, the radiologist is more likely to pay close attention to that to see if the image supports that. So it's really important to tell your radiologist that that's what you're thinking of, if that's why one of the reasons you ordered the MRI. Another uh, kind of scan that, that uh, has great value is a PET scan, a glucose PET scan. This is one of the approved uses of FTG PET in the setting of nerve generation, which is to differentiate Alzheimer's from FTD. It, you know, basically we assume that the that the uh, metabolism of glucose throughout the cortex should be roughly even. And in diseases like Alzheimer's disease, you have reduced metabolism shown by a, a little bit darker uh, gray here uh, um, uh, in the parietal region and then the occipitotemporal regions to the right and left here. But in FTD, those regions show normal metabolism and the, the hypometabolism is in the frontal regions. And sometimes 
this uh, FDG imaging can be helpful when the MRI maybe is less convincing. Here's an example of a case that had an FTD where you could see the frontal atrophy, but it's kind of subtle. And, and the uh, uh, PET scan allowed the, the frontal hypometabolism to be more easily seen. So I think MRI is usually adequate to identify the frontal atrophy that would help to confirm the syndrome. But when it's equivocal, if you're really suspicious that something um, might be FTD, that's a good reason to go ahead and order a PET scan um, in, in those kinds of situations. On the other hand, it's important, important to know that PET scans can be overread as well. So I've had cases that in the end, we decided probably didn't have any neurodegenerative disease based on our clinical grounds, but the images were read as showing hypometabolism and the medial temporal lobes. This is a region of the brain that actually, even in normal aging, you can see relatively no, low metabolism compared with the rest of the brain. So that's not really something we would consider a finding. And this is an example from a normal person, a person with normal aging who has lower metabolism in the temporal lobes here, where the yellow arrows are pointing. Also, sometimes people can read very subtle findings that are equivocal and kind of use it to bolster a case when that really is um, uh, not that convincing. So you also have to be careful of, uh, of uh, overreading that can sometimes occur. Um, so the next few minutes, I'm gonna stretch to talk about familial FTD uh, because it's important to recognize and it, and it kind of highlights a part of the assessment that, that's important for you to do and that can help you recognize that FTD is what you're dealing with. So, so when we're talking about familial FTD, we're talking about FTD that's due to a genetic abnormality or a mutation. And the mutations that tend to cause FTD, they can affect several different genes and several different mutations in each of those genes. But they tend to be, the, one, the most common ones we know about tend to be highly penetrant, meaning if you have that mutation, you're unfortunately going to get the disease if you live long enough, uh, we believe. And we think it represents a substantial proportion of FTD, um, maybe at least 15% or even more of FTD, compared with Alzheimer's, when that kind of mutation probably only occurs in one or 2% of patients with Alzheimer's. The most common genes where these mutations can occur is in these three that I'm uh, mentioning here, the CNR72, Progranulin, and MAPT genes. Um, you can learn more about those by reading. Um, but it, what's really important to know is because these are genetic abnormalities that predispose to these proteinopathies that I've talked about. They actually can present with any of the syndromes that, that I mentioned earlier in that slide with all the arrows. So in the same family, you can have one person present with BVFTD, the syndrome we're talking about today, another person present with aphasia, and a third person present with uh, uh, ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease or cortical basal degeneration. So when you're taking a family history, you have to be aware of that, that not everybody might have the same thing. So if you're thinking about FTD, and, and you, it's important to add uh, into your history that family history to see if you can strengthen the evidence in that direction. And the typical approach is you want to take a three-generation family history, including the patient's family, you go to their siblings and cousins, their, their generation, as well as the parents and grandparents, if the information's available. And you're really looking for a, a broad range of neurological and, and symptoms. So people particularly are interested in, you know, with in dementia, who and particularly people who might have had onset of that dementia before age 65, but also Parkinson's disease, uh, motor neuron disease, or Lou Gehrig's disease. And of course, many of those patients, as we talked about, could have been misdiagnosed with psychiatric disorders. So those are relevant as well. Again. There are lots of families where psychiatric disorders are common, and many of those, if not most of those families, don't have FTD, but these are symptoms you, you should be aware of. And I think familial FTD has also allowed us to understand better what the earliest symptoms of FTD are. And in fact, they've confirmed that what, what we're talking about is something that you can see even as the disease is just emerging. So here, because um, by studying families with the mutations, we can invite people in who have the mutation even before they've developed symptoms. And, and this is an example of somebody we uh, saw at one of our research programs who had FTD due to one of the mutations. And at age 53, they had irritability. Um, 
more bickering with you know their their spouse which you know doesn't sound too bad at first but this continued for the next few years without abatement they started losing jobs because of this then they developed a habit of making annoying sounds when eating um so starting to hear about those um, uh, 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 compulsive kinds of habits and uh, and and wanting to eat certain foods every day regardless uh, they got caught up in an internet scam often Patients with FTD will um, sort of show poor judgment and more vulnerability to those kinds of scams. Then a few years into that, about five years, they started to say inappropriate things in public about people's race or things like that. Um, they wouldn't have said those things before. Uh, then the family noted loss of social warmth, starting to get distracted while driving. By age 62, they had trouble keeping their job because of their temper uh, and, and started approaching strangers in the street not recognizing when they should be develop, seeing cues that that person might not want to talk to them. And now that person has significant uh, trouble getting things done even at home. He can't, doesn't have a job, hard to keep a job. And, and, and even at this stage, cognitive testing is still normal. So that's why executive dysfunction is only one of the six items that you could find on the clinical criteria we talked about. So in looking at these things, you know, colleagues have written papers showing that basically the kinds of things in the prodromal phase of FTD are really the kinds of things we see in the full-blown syndrome as well. So, the, so it just shows that, that these are things that you want to keep an eye out for. On the other hand, they've also taught us that the spectrum of FTLD can be quite broad. So we've also seen cases with um, uh, who presented with things that we don't usually think of in FTD, delusions of the type you hear with schizophrenia. In this case uh, thought that their home was bugged. They thought their neurologist was killed and replaced by someone else, which is a syndrome we call Capgas, Capgrass syndrome in the psychiatric literature. They had delusions that they were some kind of sexual god. Um, they had hallucinations, hearing voices. Um, and actually their initial imaging did not show a lot of atrophy but they ended up having this C9 or 72 mutation that I've been describing. And within a few years, they developed more of the typical symptoms of FTD, including overeating, apathy and social withdrawal and motor neuron disease. So here's a case where they looked quite similar to what we would think of as a typical psychiatric syndrome, but developing it quite late in life, which was the reason that their providers thought to, you know, that maybe this wasn't due to a uh, typical psychiatric non-neurological illness. So, so I think when we think about the potential overlap between psychiatric disorders and FTD and how a patient with FTD might be misdiagnosed with a psychiatric illness, I think of it as kind of two different ways at least. You know, one is that there are patients with the typical FTD features like apathy or obsessive and compulsive behaviors that are labeled with um, uh, a psychiatric illness, but when you look closely at the symptoms, they don't really match the symptoms. So the apathy is not associated with the, the other features of depression. Or the repetitive habits and obsessions, they're not associated with anxiety and discomfort and, and, and other features that are typical of OCD. The OCD is very bothersome to patients with OCD, whereas it wouldn't be to most patients with FTD. Um, and uh, um, you know, some of the features like irritability and disinhibition can be diagnosed as bipolar. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think there are probably presentations where it would be quite reasonable to label this as a psychiatric syndrome, like late life delusional disorder, which might have been applied to the patient I just talked about. Um, um, but one of the things that, that at least would clue you into the fact that um, uh, you should think about a neurological cause like FTD is because it's atypical in some way, and particularly some of the same ways we talked about right above here, but also maybe that it's late in onset. And usually these cases do develop more typical symptoms, so keeping an eye is one way to, to make sure you don't miss that. The last few slides are talking about biomarkers. So one biological marker that we do have now is amyloid imaging. So this is a PET imaging that is sensitive to the amyloid plaques that we talked about in Alzheimer's disease. Um, some, uh, sometimes people, as we said, with executive dysfunction and even some of these behavioral features might um, uh, 
be thought of having FTD, but they could have Alzheimer's disease as a cause. So one way to make sure whether it's Alzheimer's disease or not is to get this PET imaging. Unfortunately, it's not very easily available. It's not covered by Medicare or most other insurance. We'll see if that changes over time, depending on the evolution of, of uh, Alzheimer's field. But we also, um, I also should point out that there's now um, uh, uh, the prospect of getting blood tests that would be sensitive to the proteins that are associated with Alzheimer's disease including that A beta that we talked about that gets in the amyloid plaques. We can now measure that in blood. And that uh, phosphorylated tau that gets into the tangles, we can measure that in blood. And uh, although these are currently experimental uh, uh, assessments, uh, a lot of, uh, of experts in my, in my field think that these things might be available within a relatively short time for clinical use. And so then again, they would help with that differential versus Alzheimer's disease. Another uh, uh, biological marker that could be useful um, is, is this neurofilament light chain. Again, it's currently experimental. This is a non-specific marker of neurological injury. So you can see it elevated in all of these things listed on the left here, including neurodegenerative disease. Um, so it won't tell you if somebody has FTD versus something else, but it might tell you if somebody has a non-neurological psychiatric disorder versus something like FTD. We'll see, we have to continue to do work with this, um, uh, uh, um, med, you know, this uh, protein uh, to try to understand if it has the, the capabilities we think it does, but, but also it may very well be available within the next couple of years as a clinically available measure. So uh, I'm just really getting to the wrap up stage, you know, to conclude, you know, this behavioral variant of FTD is primarily disorder of social and emotional changes, not just executive. It can occur in, typically in the mid 40s of older. Um, if the complaints are mainly cognitive or executive, just also think about Alzheimer's disease and neuropsychological testing can even be normal. Um, um, I'm gonna come back to the bottom point in a minute. Um, when, things sound, when you start to think about overlap with psychiatric changes, um, you really have to think hard about whether these are typical of the syndrome you're thinking about, whether the apathy is associated with low mood, hopelessness, et cetera. We've talked about that already. And is it age, the age typical? You know, even bipolar disease is not that common after age 45. It's really not that common after age 65. And those numbers are even less common for things like schizophrenia. Uh, and lastly, family history can be very helpful. This three generation family history, looking for a variety of different syndromes that could be due to FTLD proteinopathies. Um, and, uh, um, um, you know, the MRI, uh, if the clinical features make you specific, you want to do the MRI to provide additional evidence. And you can consider an FTG if you think the MRI is equivocal or your, uh, your you know, neurologist colleague does or your radiologist. And we may get additional biomarkers in the next few years. So the last thing I want to do is highlight the fact that, you know, uh, um, it's very helpful to take a systematic approach to detecting these kinds of symptoms. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think you have to develop a repertoire of questions where you, you say, well, I hear that you have some initial complaints, whether it's personality or memory or whatever, but to go through systematically all these other symptoms but, um, to see if maybe the initial complaint really is not the most prominent change, which often is the case in BVFTD. Somebody might come in complaining of one thing and then you realize there's a bigger thing that you've elicited as you talk to them. So one tool that I like that that I think can be very helpful is uh, the California Alzheimer's Disease Centers developed this toolkit, which is meant to help support a diagnosis of a potential neurodegenerative disease. And it's, and it's built to detect all of them, uh, Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, as well as FTD and the various ver things that we talked about at the beginning. And so the idea is that helps you by giving you examples of questions that we've found to be very useful, by, um, by um, giving you uh, examples, uh, by briefly laying out, you know, what the different symptoms of different disorders are, by giving you examples of common answers to these questions that we've often heard in our clinical practices and sort of interpreting them for you as being typical for Alzheimer's or typical for aging, 
or may be indicative of something that, uh, that you know, is more unusual and should prompt referral. Um, we give scripts for disclosure as examples that you can use because that's often a difficult thing for people who aren't comfortable and, and uh, don't do uh, dementia assessment a lot. Um, uh, and uh, we, we also have some billing guidance to help think about how to um, you know, bill for the, for the time that it could take to do this assessment. So the last thing I want to highlight then is just um, that there are places you can go to learn more and to get involved. Um, uh, one is the for patients or families or other people who are affected by FTD. There's the FTD Disorders Registry where you can learn about more research and be kept up to date on uh, what's happening in the, in the FTD community. Um, there's also for people who might want to enroll in FTD-related research, we have a large project called All FTD that, uh, that uh, is for uh, both uh, patients affected by the disease as well as family members who might uh, have familial FTD running in their family. And of course, if, if you can't think of anywhere else or just want to go to one place, the Association for FTD is your one-stop shop for all of these kinds of things. And so I want to thank uh, Esther and, uh, Kane and Will Ryder and uh, Matt Ozga for organizing this and making it so easy. And uh, I appreciate you all listening and I, I hope this was helpful. Dr. Rosen, thank you so much. My mind is spinning right now and I probably will be following up with questions shortly. But one question we got from our audience that I think might be helpful is the topic of anosognosia. We see that quite often um, and it really makes diagnosis difficult. So is there anything that you do or that your colleagues do to maybe help when the patient doesn't think there's anything wrong and the family's seeing issues? So I, I guess there's two, there's a lot of elements to that, right? One is uh, one is the fact that um, uh, for many years we thought of it as an important component of diagnosis, in, in that if the and I still believe that you know if the patient themselves is bitterly complaining of all of these symptoms, it makes us a little suspicious that that's unusual in FTD. But I do think it's what we've learned from the mutation carriers is that early on, especially when we're talking about executive changes or more subtle changes you know, people can notice it and complain as well. So it's not an absolute rule out. And, and that's one of the reasons it's not one of the main criteria. That said, it is very common. And, and I would still say it's typical that once the disease has developed to a certain point, patients, anosognosia, meaning patients who have the problem don't recognize the problem themselves. They may even say, well, you told me I have FTD, but they don't believe it. They don't act like it. So it's a sort of nuanced kind of anosognosia. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I think, um, you know, it can be very difficult to, so uh, I also heard in the question, the fact that that kind of anosognosia can make um, uh, moving forward with the assessment and, and moving forward with treatment recommendations difficult. And, you know, I think that's definitely true. I think that the best you can do is try to, you know, um, uh, talk to the patient as well and try to acknowledge their, uh, um, you know, agency in this whole process to try to get the, you know, family, significant other, et cetera, as your ally and sort of work through it as best as possible. I don't think there's an easy answer to it or, a, a, um, uh, yeah, I'll just stop rambling because <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a tough one in terms of management. It is. It is. It's very tough, and I, I think a lot of families struggle with it, and the physicians mm. struggle with it too. I I will say one thing. Uh, it can be very helpful to explain that there is such a thing as anosognosia without using the term, mm. because I think it's very natural for family members or significant others of anyone with neurodegenerative disease to assume that the person should know more and when they don't acknowledge things or behave in a way that acknowledges it, that it's more like a psychological denial and they really do know. And, and if I could just remind them a few more times, they'll get it. And I think it can be very helpful and often it takes multiple times and the person, the family member has to be ready to kind of be educated in this way, to tell them that this is a feature of the diseases, that it's, uh, that there's, the ability to see what's going on with ourselves is a function of the brain, just like everything else. And that function can be impaired by these diseases. And that reminding, 
and all the normal things we do to point out to people that they have flaws or <laughs> made mistakes, they don't work in this situation. And that can be really helpful. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Sometimes it's just a matter of recognizing it that makes the big difference. I think I'm going to ask you one more quick question if I can. And that is, you know, we talk a lot about how memory is not very common in FTD, but we do see it. And we do have patients who have FTD or, you know, possible probable FTD, but yet they're having memory loss. And can you just speak a little bit to the to memory? Yeah, I agree that that memory loss can be uh, uh, common. I think there's two levels of thinking you want to do. So first of all, people can perform poorly on memory tests, and it doesn't mean their every mem everyday memory is as bad as that test would indicate. Mm -hmm. So if it's really clear to you in talking to the family and the patient that they they know about recent events, they know about you know stuff that happened, you know that's what we mean by memory not being impaired. They might not perform well on the test. However, we also hear within FTD that um, real forgetting can occur and it can be relatively early. And I, I think it's, uh, although the research criteria talk about spared memory as being a very important part of the diagnosis, I think a lot of us experts have said, well, that's kind of a loose one. And if everything else fits, that's not a good enough reason to rule it out. Um, so that's my best answer, Esther. That's a good answer. <laughs> I appreciate any answer because I think it's a topic that a lot of people are talking about and that people have questions about. Um, so we don't want to use it completely as exclusionary when we're talking about FTD. And I think that's important. And that's something even in our language we're trying to be more broad about. Even though we don't always see it, it doesn't mean you can't have it. Um, that's right. So I think one last question, and I'm actually going to take this one because somebody, and you can chime in a little bit, but somebody asked why diagnose somebody with FTD? Like, what's the benefit of them actually getting the diagnosis of, over a regular dementia diagnosis? And I would just say that for the family and the person diagnosed, it's like trying to fit a, um, a square peg in a round hole. And very often those families feel like that nobody else understands exactly what they're experiencing and what they're dealing with. Very often they're younger in the diagnostic process and the support and education they can receive by having a more formalized diagnosis really goes far for the family. That's the um, support and ed response to that type of question. But Dr. Rosen, what is your response to that as a clinician? I agree with that uh, 100% that that's it's very helpful. You know, I also think that um, I would answer that question not specifically about FTD, but about the idea that we are, I, I hope and believe, emerging into an era, starting with Alzheimer's disease, where we can potentially give people disease modifying treatments that that um, that might slow the disease down or change you know the when the bad symptoms show up, et cetera. And so I think this is why I highlighted the toolkit at the end. I think it's really important that included in primary care, people start to think of that, you know, reacquaint themselves with the fact that you know dementias and cognitive impairment can be caused by different disorders that the specific treatment would be different and you know and that you and that um and that in fact um you know just because something on the surface looks initially like it might be alzheimers it might not be with further discussion and it's really it it's important to recognize that maybe there's some other symptoms going on especially if they have some memory loss but all these other features don't make sense so i i i think um there's an element here of sort of getting getting people comfortable with the idea that that you know we're starting to enter a phase where there's yet another reason why it makes a difference which is it can affect the treatment also i think it really helps with not only the family's um uh kind of relief at saying well there is an explanation for this and it fits what we what we're seeing etc but i think it really helps with their um uh, uh connection with their care provide care providers to sort of you know be told like there is something that, that fits what you're seeing and it it makes sense and and it's well described and um, um, and so that everybody's on the same page it's validating I, I think is the yeah where I think for a lot of people it's validating for them to get the actual to get a diagnosis it just explains things and it gives them purpose um, 
And on that note, I think we're going to go into our final session. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosen, for this presentation. I can't begin to describe how much we appreciate you here at AFTD for um, talking about this really difficult subject and um, the resource that this is going to be able to have in the future moving forward. So thank you so much for that today. It was a pleasure. So I just want to sit here and say, you know, how can people living with FTD learn more about research opportunities like Dr. Rosen was just talking about? The best way is to encourage your patients to get involved is to have them sign up at the FTD Disorders Registry by visiting ftdregistry.org. The registry provides one location to learn about research participation opportunities and share their stories to inform research design. Participants' personal information is never shared. You can also sign up for AFTD's newsletters at the AFT.org to stay informed about emerging research opportunities and the progress being made in existing studies. The next webinar in the AFTD Healthcare Professional Education webinar series is scheduled to take place in April. Stay tuned to AFTD's website for more information. Thank you for joining us, and thanks again to Dr. Rosen for his informative presentation. Thanks also to Rush University for allowing us to offer continuing education credits for this webinar. If you have any additional questions or comments about today's presentation, please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Thank you.